I've got my main theme. I like it, but how can I develop it? Maybe I'll go to five with the same melody. I could uh, lengthen the note values. Oh, maybe I'll try it in minor. All right, that sounds pretty cool. What else? Backwards? Upside down? Let's try some new ideas. You're listening to Music Student 101. Here are your hosts, Jeremy Burns and Matthew Scott Phillips. Hey, Matt. Hey, Jeremy. I understand you have embarked on a new journey. I have? In recent times, yeah. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, yeah, well, I have started singing lessons. Tell me about it, man. Well, you know, um, I've always been terrified of singing. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, I, I've been a musician all, all my life, and, you know, first time I ever played music in front of people, I was probably 13 years old. Mm. Uh, but I've never been a comfortable singer. Yeah. And it's always been scary. It's always been terrifying to me. And so I thought it was high time I have faced my fears and I started taking vocal lessons. I've had a couple of this point, a lot of breathing exercises. Oh, yeah? Yeah, learning to breathe the right way so you're not straining your vocal cords and uh, all of those things, a few little warm ups and stuff. And uh, yeah, it's fun. Learning how to crawl. Right. Before you learn how to fly. Right, yeah. It, it's, it's fascinating going all the way back to being just a uh, just a beginning learner in something like that, you know, a, a, after having, you know, uh, thinking of myself as, as an advanced musician for so long, you know, and it, it, it's humbling in a very good way uh, to, to be all the way back to square one where, you know, you're just learning the very, very basics of, of what is essentially a new instrument. Yeah, I, I kind of went through the same when I was decided, even though I've been playing bass for about 35 years or right. so, I decided, or 30 years, I guess, I decided to uh, go ahead and take lessons myself, yep. because you can always learn new things. Absolutely. Know? Absolutely. I imagine that's why a lot of people listen to this podcast. Hopefully, we're, they're learning something new at some point, you know. Well, congratulations on you taking that step. I think it's Thanks. a cool thing. I, I'm still terrified. We have not gotten past the terrified stage yet, but I'm not you know, sure if that goes. Baby away. steps. I can sing harmony all day long, but if you put me in a, in a lead vocal position, who, 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 boy, yeah, I might be terrified. Yeah, see, I, I'm I'm also terrified to sing harmony. I'm I'm terrified that I'm hitting the wrong note. <laughs> yeah. Well, now that you're in a band, it might come up. You it know? might. It, it very well might. You know, they're already talking about you know, um putting a mic in my face and I'm, I'm resisting virulently. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> putting a mic in your face, huh? Yeah. That's cool. That's, yeah. That was, that was... <laughs> we'll see how cool it is. Let's get a, take a, put your voice under a microscope. You know, I've always said the one way to get out of doing anything is to suck at it. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, you know, that may be my ticket to not having to sing is to sing really badly. We'll see. Yeah. But you're not paying to suck at it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. A, Let's talk about rats for a second here. Rats? Rats, yeah. Okay. We're going to cover a lot of ground on this We're gonna episode. We're going to cover a lot. This is, a wi this is going to be a wide-ranging episode, isn't <laughs> it? I can feel it. So listen to this, man. I, I recently read that a study released in the Science Advances Journal, Uh huh. a study led by uh, Hi Hirokazu Takahashi, Uh huh. has revealed that rats respond and react to at least the rhythmic aspect of music. Oh, fascinating. They played pieces like uh, Lady Gaga's Born This Way and uh, Mozart Sonata at varying speeds. Yeah. And uh, they were able to, um, by tracking the rat's head's movements and the brain activities, they found that they respond most to tempos between 120 and 140 BPM. That's interesting. Isn't it? Now, this kind of shatters an idea that I had. You know, I thought that maybe we, we enjoy the tempo 120 or it's become standardized BPM. Yeah. To 140 BPM based on our heart rates. You know what I mean? Well, what's a rat's average heart rate? Well, that's where it falls apart. You know, the average human heart rate is about 60 to 100 BPM. Yeah. Whereas a rat is uh, 330 to 480 BPM. Okay. So, yeah, maybe not. So, um, now, if that, by that logic, hummingbirds would be into speed metal. <laughs> Elephants and whales would be on the dirge <laughs> scene, you know? 
Yeah, there, there, there's, there's a lot uh, still left to know from what I'm hearing over here. Yeah, well, I mean, are they responding to the rhythms, or is it just you know the kind of noise that attracts their attention? Right. I mean, it could be you know the the rhythm of something that could be creeping up on them, or you know. Now you'll have to ask uh, Hiro <laughs> Hirokazu Takahashi about that. Yeah, but it's my understanding that they were correlating it directly to the rhythms, and it, okay. it, it must be based on the beats they're hearing. You know. Yeah. Head movements. They're not saying that they're dancing. They're not dancing. They, they wanted to be very clear about that. Yeah. They're not bobbing their heads. They're just responding. Mm -hmm. They're not ignoring the rhythms. Responding more so to this this certain tempo range. Yeah. Which I think is just fascinating. Yeah. I mean, that could be you know the tempo of a you know a dog chasing them or something. You know. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure they would respond to that. They would. Yeah. They're probably hardwired to respond. How many BPMs does a dog's leg make when it runs? I mean, who knows? <laughs> but, you know, I mean, whether they're responding musically is is still a, a big, huge question. That And who really knows what's going on in a rat's brain? I mean. Well, there's a reason they study them for uh, these human studies, you know? Mm, oh, well, yeah, that's true. Anyways, uh, getting back to this human world, or yeah. rather to the music world. <laughs> uh, this episode will be melodic organization and theme development. Right. And, you know, there's no magic formula for writing a good musical theme mm -hmm. or a good musical melody. Yeah. Um, there, there are observations we can make about melodies that will help us, you mm -hmm. know, and, and knowing these observations may, may uh, help you make uh, educated guesses. But, you know, in my experience, writing good melodies has always been kind of a trial and error process, mm -hmm. you know, and the best melodies defy all the rules. So, <laughs> yeah, but, but there are some observations we can make about how melodies get constructed and, you know, those are definitely uh, worth taking a look at. Yeah. And also ways to take a melody and improve on it, alter it, uh, keep it throughout the piece and keep it interesting mm -hmm. without being too repetitive. Right, yeah. Basically ways to tweak a melody. Yeah, and, and make it a better melody in and of itself. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think it's kind of what we're striving towards in this episode. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Or just better music in general, huh? Just better music in general. That's always our goal. Well, before we get into all that, shall we get into our new reviews and our social section here? Let's do. Let's do. So we have a new review. Mm-hmm. Uh, five stars. Yeah. From uh, Lizzie Harpist from Great Britain. Yeah. Who calls us informative and inspiring. Oh, thank, thank you, you so much, Lizzie. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Lizzie says, I'm a mature student doing a BA in music in the UK, and I've been binge listening to this podcast since I started my course a few weeks ago. <laughs> there you go. Uh, it has been absolutely invaluable. I can't imagine what my music theory studies would have been like without it. The emphasis on ear training has been really helpful, especially the frequent, reass the frequent reassurance from Matthew that these skills can be learned by anyone. Yes, <laughs> yes, they can. Let me reiterate that reassurance. <laughs> anyone can learn this. this Indeed. Is, yeah. We are re-reassuring. We are re-reassuring. Yeah. Um, I also appreciate the attention to detail. For example, original bumper music for each episode. Uh, you can thank our good Mr. Burns for that. Well, thank you. Although, Matt, your, have, your pieces have showed up. Occasionally, yeah. Uh, which relates to the content that will be discussed. Uh, somebody, is, is, somebody is listening carefully here, picking yeah. up on. Uh, Jeremy's bumper music almost always relates conceptually to what we're talking about in some way or another. <laughs> Uh, which is, is is fascinating how he manages to pull that off. It's great to hear someone besides you notice that, Matt. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> uh, thank you, Jeremy and Matthew, for the immense amount of work you put into this podcast. I will be spreading the word with my fellow students. So thank you so much, Lizzie. We really appreciate that. It, it really uh, always is... Uh, uh, very gratifying to me to hear of a music student who is actually helped in their music studies by this podcast, mm -hmm. I, especially at the pod. I, I, sorry, especially at the uh, college level. You know, that's uh, that's always very gratifying to me having you know dealing with uh, music students as they learn theory myself and knowing how stressful that can be. It's always nice to know that you're helping in some in some small way. Absolutely, because you know? yeah, it ain't easy. It ain't. It is stressful. We said anyone can do it, but we didn't say it would be easy. We didn't easy. say, yeah, we said anyone can do it, not that it's easy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, uh, incidentally, I saw her on Patreon, a Lizzie from Birmingham, England, joined up and messaged on the community board saying that she played the harp. 
the harp. So Ooh. I wonder if this might be also our new Patreon patron here. So, perhaps. I am also seeing a general correlation between reviewers and Patreon patrons, you know? Yeah. So that's like double whammy. They review yeah. us and then they, and then they to... Which we greatly appreciate. Yeah. And you can uh, uh, patron us on Patreon too, yes. noble uh, listeners. You can get on Patreon, uh, backslash musicstudent101.com. And uh, yeah, we have like a certain kind of tiers of different members that, you know, a do- one to two dollars will get you uh, in- onto the site and you can watch the cool... Cool Vi- stuff. Videos or b- yeah. mainly the bonus episodes. Videos of Jeremy's band actually playing the bumper music we were talking about. And Some of it. Yeah. And then we have at least at least 15, 16, maybe more bonus episodes. Bonus episodes. Point. Yep. And then if you give uh, $3 to $4 a month, you will get uh, a coffee bug. Or not a coffee mug anymore. Like a, it's, it's more of a thermos now. You'll, you'll get some form of drinkware with our name on it. <laughs> yes. We've been doing this for six years. We can't keep on saying coffee mug. It's not a coffee mug. <laughs> it's no longer a coffee. We ran out of the coffee mugs. We went to the thermos. You know, I never mentioned this, but for people who don't want the coffee mug, uh, we did say that we would also, we got these little music, these little notebooks, these little notation books. We just, oh, yeah. I just slap a Music Student 101 sticker on it, yeah. but we sign it and we put a nice little message in there. So yeah. that's- Yeah, we should, we should get back to doing that. Well, one of our listeners recently reminded me of that and I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. We'll, oh we'll yeah. That to you. So yeah, that's another option. Yeah, and move. and is it the five dollar tier where we answer a question? Yeah, yeah, five dollar tier. Of course, you get the mug or the notebook, or you can ask us a question, and we'll make it into a fifteen plus. Yeah, minute we will spend at least fifteen minutes on the Patreon site. Yeah, answering your question specifically in a uh, Patreon video for the other patrons. Yeah. yeah, other great patrons like our friend James Reed from Washington D.C. Oh yeah, so uh, James found us on Reddit. Uh-huh. And why do we say where people find us? I guess so people will know where they can also where they can find us. It. Everyone has. I didn't a... know we were on Reddit. That's that's fascinating. Well, it's just a discussion board. We I think a lot of people actually find us on there. Oh, nice. Yeah, links to the show and everything. Very nice. So uh, James says, um, I have really enjoyed listening to all the episodes you and Matt have spent a ton of time and effort putting together. I live in Fairfax, Virginia, in the Washington D.C. metro area. I was a music minor in college and had two exceptional theory teachers. Doctors Jocelyn Neal and Severine Neff. Nice. Severine Neff? Severine. Severine, yeah. Who sparked an interest in diving deeper into music theory, history, and composition. Now I'm in a completely unrelated field professionally, finance, but have been so happy to have found this podcast where I can continue to soak in all that the music study has to offer. Mm, nice. My main instrument growing up was a B-flat clarinet. As with many other single reed in- uh, musicians, I also dabbled in bass clarinet, E-flat clarinet, alto right. sax, and tenor sax. Yeah. A multi-wind, in- a multi-wind uh, instrument. Yeah, well, the, the key fingerings are the same across those instruments. So you uh, just... So, so clarinet is often uh, move back and forth. And the, but, but they often use the different, uh, different uh, clefs, like... Middle. Actually, actually, no. They, they, they all mainly stay in treble clef, and then they, the instruments transpose. They keep it treble, huh? Yeah. Uh, check out our orchestration episode. Oh, yeah. Or did we do an orchestration episode? <laughs> yeah, I think we did. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll go back and double check on check that. Check that. <laughs> hey, 117 episodes hey, in. Hey, they all start to run together, and then we have plans for like a 200 more, so... I have to go back and listen to all those episodes to make sure I'm not telling all the same jokes and uh, <laughs> stories over and over again. Right. <laughs> oh, where were we? We digress. We digress. James continues. These days, it's more just noodling on the piano and writing little snippets of music when I can find the time. Our 15-month-old daughter, Emma, and dog, Winston, <laughs> keep me and my wife, Julia, pretty busy. <laughs> Sounds like. I very much enjoy music for the Romantic Era classical music, as well as film scores. Uh, big Ludwig Gorans- Goransson fan at the moment. Mm. Uh, thanks again for all you and Matt do, and excited to continue to listen to the show. Uh, thank you very much, James, and thank you for your support. We really appreciate it. And it's cool that James gave a shout out to his uh, his uh, professors. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. And uh, we want to give them a shout out too because it, it does take something for a professor to keep people interested and excited. Oh, tell me, <laughs> tell me about it, man. I'm yeah. preaching to the choir over there, man. <laughs> and then congratulations on the wee baby. I know it's 15 Indeed. months old, yeah. but that's still brand new baby in my mind. Yeah. <laughs> so thanks again, our good new Patreon, James Reed. Yep. Now. Matt, what do I have on our show notes for this listener this mail? This says Keith Andrews and the Ducks. 
It is story time. Yay. That, we have a cautionary tale from our friend Keith Andrews in lieu of a listener mail today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Some of you may remember our friend Keith Andrews from a past episode, uh, Transcribing Music, I believe it was. Yes. And we featured a piece he was working on at the time, Dewey and Dora. Right. And uh, he since then sent me a lot of his original music, and he's just, he's, he's blazing. He's doing great. He's Good. Great uh, up until more recently, so... <laughs> There's a great little duck pond in Arlington, Texas, uh-huh. where uh, Keith likes to show up early on Saturdays and Sundays. <laughs> he wants to fill up these ducks on duck-healthy grain before all the bread feeders show up with <laughs> not-so-duck-healthy bread. <laughs> now, Keith is also a head honcho with these ducks. Okay. When he shows up, they always swarm around him oh, uh, I bet. Uh, on his arrival. <laughs> He has one little duck buddy who likes to stand real close to him and gaze up at him, probably out of admiration or gratitude. Oh, I bet. Yeah. yeah. Not hunger. or <laughs> Where, Where's my next grain bit, man? <laughs> Give me my grain. <laughs> he was uh, taking pictures, pictures of some other ducks, and he turned back around, and he saw his little duck buddy standing. You know, he almost tripped over him. So to, so to avoid stepping on his duck buddy, Keith takes a dive, landing on his left hand and hyperextending a few of his fingers. Ooh, ouch. So, um... I saw this post on Facebook, and he actually contacted me about it, saying, what do I do now? You know, it's like, any ideas on what I can do now that my hand is not working? Yeah. I was like, do you have a piano? Singing lessons? And he was like, I have two of them. <laughs> Singing lessons. Well, he, <laughs> he actually sings really good. Yeah. He's got like a kind of uh, John Prine thing going. Yeah, right, right. I remember. From... But we could always improve. Oh, yeah. But I think he's going to work on some of his songwriting. But this is just, a, you know, it, it, it reminds me of our friend Michael Moore, who um, had a horrible accident where he lost his fingers yeah, on yeah, his right. left hand. His solution was just to flip the guitar around and learn how to play left-handed. Right, you know? yeah. But um, there's a discussion that could be had about, uh, well, maybe, for one thing, being extra sensitive for your important parts that you use to play these instruments. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I try to remind myself when I'm walking down a set of stairs, three points of contact. I always have, a, if, the, if the rail is gross, I'll hover my hand over it, you know? Yeah. But I'm always thinking about that kind of stuff. But the minute you, the minute you're not thinking about it, the second you're not thinking about it is yeah. when it happens. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So what do we do with that um, in our convalescence, you know? Uh, right. So maybe that's that, that could be an interesting discussion. Because, I mean, we're getting older, you know? This is... We're more breakable. <laughs> We're more fragile than we used to be. Totally. <laughs> I don't think I could ever do a good tumble down the stairs, but I know I'm, I could do it worse than I would have 20 years ago. Yeah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> it would cause more damage. But um, you know what I bet will make Keith feel better? What is that? Is if we all get up on Spotify and uh, whatever musical uh, platform we listen to and listen to his new version of Dewey and Dora. Oh, yeah. Let's do that. It's beautifully done. It's really well done. Uh, he's he finally re-recorded it and mastered it, and it's all it's all good to go. And he got this out just before he messed up his hands. So yeah, at least he got that taken care of. Yeah. So Keith, we love you, brother. We hope you get better. Uh, maybe take some singing lessons. <laughs> and uh, Keith doesn't blame the ducks, nor do I. Yeah, <laughs> Keith doesn't blame the ducks. All good. <laughs> and we all know ducks make every story just a little bit funnier. Oh yeah even though it's kind of a horrible situation. So let's move on, shall we? Let's do. It is time to get into this, this um, melodic development techniques. Melodic development techniques. So, you know, how do we, how do we develop a good melody? You know, what springs to my mind, there are a couple of stories from, you know, classical music lore, and a lot of these are, you know, steeped in rumor and myth and everything. But, uh, you know, it, it was always said that Mozart would just ferment melodies out of his head, right? Mm -hmm. They would just bring to him and he'd just, just be, you know, uh, uh, it would just write them down as is and there you go. Uh, whereas Beethoven, by comparison, you know, we have these sketchbooks where he, you know, went back over some of these, some of his most famous melodies. He went back over them over and over and over again. Getting you know one very uh, one draft and then a second draft and a third and a fourth, just trying to get them exactly right, mm -hmm. right. And to me, what Beethoven is is doing here is is trying to perfect uh, the melody itself, which is a different discussion from you know the making the phrase and how the phrases go together and the chord progression and things like this. It, it is it is in fact the melody itself that he's working on here. It's the musical aspect compared to the structural aspect, right. 
uh-huh. something like that. Yeah, sort of the rhetorical aspect uh-huh. uh, compared to the compared to the uh, structural aspect. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of what we're talking about now. Is is you know sort of giving us some and like I said, you know, there's no magic formula for writing a good melody, but uh, if you feel like you know your melodies just just aren't what what they could be, you know, then you could try some of these techniques, mm-hmm. right? Some some of these things to uh, these are some good things to think about, right? And uh, now, real quick, I got a question for you: mm-hmm. Mozart and Beethoven were more or less contemporaries, were they? Were they more or less uh, age difference, but they were in the same kind of classical period. Yeah, they would have been more contemporaries had Mozart lived longer. Uh-huh. You know, Mozart died at 33. Yeah. Uh, I heard a story once of Mozart uh, hearing five-year-old Beethoven perform and saying something to the effect of, you know, keep an eye on this kid. He's going to really be something, you know. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Hey, this kid's going places. This kid's going places, yeah. So, so they're more or less contemporaries in the grand scheme, scheme of things. Mozart's a little earlier. But, we all, but we're, we're saying that Mozart just kind of these these just kind of came right out came out of his head where Beethoven actually took a different approach and yeah okay. now Mozart may have just burned all his sketchbooks who knows he but, might have yeah but but yeah the, the is the idea is the the mythos around Mozart is they came out unbidden I think most of us are probably a little more like Beethoven and that you know we kind of have to think about these yeah uh, a little bit and and refine them you know as as we create them or at least we should be. Is it safe to say Beethoven used a little bit more thematic development? Yes. Um, what would you say? You want to go ahead and talk about that? Yeah, what? so thematic development. This could be deriving musical material from a theme or melody that has already been presented. We also talk about it as the process by which these themes generate more music, mm-hmm. uh, generate a- extended music. Uh, in this process, melody and harmony are, typ- typ- are typically an interplay and affect one another. Um, typically in, in Western classical music, for example, and by the way, you know, we're talking about classical music here, but these, these, these techniques apply to pop music and folk music and and everything else too. Mm -hmm. Uh, They really do. Um, but, uh, a composition usually begins with a theme, which is later developed in the following, uh, uh, sections. So, you know, the classical, the, the classic example of this is Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, right? So, and you know, you, you can think of this as our little motivic fragment. Just four notes. It's just four notes, yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And then he develops this thematically by taking uh, this interval, this major third inter- interval. Right? And moving it down. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and then continues. Right, it's all the same motive, just in different little, uh, in, in different voicings and different, yeah, yeah, registers, yeah, oh. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So he's that, that little three note, three or four note uh, motive really creates the entire symphony. Mm-hmm. Uh, have I mentioned that Beethoven's a genius? Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> it, it really creates the entire symphony when when you uh, listen to it. It's present in all four movements and unifies the whole thing and, and all that. But this is this is an idea of uh, thematic development. Yeah. Because you know. the rhythm, I mean, he speeds it up at some point or moves things around, but the rhythm is still got that ba 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 And the interve- and the interval structure, that third interval structure is still there. So it's very, in that way, it's, it remains recognizable. Absolutely. Through, the piece. through, through all of these iterations. Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah. there's many iterations, right? Yeah. yeah. And that, that's the uh, classic example. I mean, you have basic idea. Uh huh. You've Fairly es- simple. You've established right? the yeah. theme. Primary motive. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and just kind of reaching up. Mm-hmm. And then... Same mm-hmm. basic idea, just up now, right? Same rhythms. Too, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. You know, and then... So, and, and then uh, that different idea on the way down, mm-hmm. right? That sort of simplified version of it on the way down. Yeah. So rather than just 
playing random notes all over the place. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we have taken uh, this, this recognizable melodic structure and used that to create the melody going forward. This is thematic development. It's way more intentional than something just springing out of your head. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I guess it's time now to talk about some of the very many techniques that we can yes. utilize while trying to develop a melody, huh? Right. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, one of the one of the things that I have really kind of been doing in both of these melodies, well, me and Beethoven, mm-hmm. uh, is is uh, repetition and transposition. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, repetition is is easy enough to to think about. <laughs> Right? Mm-hmm. I mean, so we, we've done this, or sorry, you know, we've done this uh, a couple of times, you know, mm-hmm. this is repetition. Yeah. Um, a transposition, you know, moving that idea up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to be able to play this. Um. You know, this this little half note thing mm-hmm. has been both re- repeated and then transposed down. What's that from? This is from uh, Beethoven's Piano Sonata in G Major. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And then and then repeated mm-hmm. the whole the whole section repeated. Right. So the first two measures. Like that, and then and then transposed up. So it's the same. So it's the same melody. He just moved the whole uh, pattern up. Yeah. Like a uh, how how much? Yeah, pattern. Pattern is a good word. He moved that whole melodic pattern up a step. And by that I mean that he's keeping, he's honoring the uh, pattern of half steps, the whole steps, or whatever, whatever. Mm, the, pa- inter- the pattern of intervals. Intervals, yeah. whatever he uses. Yeah. Yeah, diatonically. You know, I mean, he he's adjusting to stay in the key. Mm-hmm. Right, so what was may have been a major third to begin with is now a minor third because you've moved up the scale. Mm-hmm. You know that's called a tonal sequence. We'll get into that in a minute. <laughs> now, there's this whole uh, now. So repetition is always you just play the same thing twice or play it yeah. later on, play the exact same notes. It's basically uh, uh, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, think about smoke on the water. Bump, 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 bump. Yeah. Now, if they went to with a full- little tail on it, but that bump, 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 repeated a lot, right? Yeah. But if they had gone to four, well, I don't know. If, I don't think they did. But if they did, and they went. Bum, 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 bum. Yeah. That would be what we would call a transposition. Transposition, yeah. Because you're playing the same melody, but you're playing it in a, in a, in a different, yeah. higher up or lower down. So if they'd... Yeah. And then... <laughs> or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Usually these, these, these things are good for two, maybe three times, and then you want to do something else, right? You get that itch to hear something different. Yeah, yeah. You know, a good melody is a combination of repetition and variation, you know? So repetition and transposition are the two simplest things you can do to a melody to keep it interesting, right? In my opinion. Yeah. Now, a variation you just brought up. Yeah, variation. A varied repetition or variation. Okay, uh, wait, before we move on, I want to uh, one more question about okay. the uh, repetition and transposition. Yeah, yeah. Is this strictly regarding the melody, or does this also include harmonic content? This is very much harmonic content as well. Okay. So, one of the big misconceptions people, I think, have about melodies is that melody and harmony are two completely different things. Mm-hmm. They are really not. A melody is really just a, a, a harmony-laid flat mm-hmm. yeah i mean just just sort of laid on its side mm-hmm. yeah so i mean if you um if i was to go back to that uh, original beethoven example so we're in c minor right mm-hmm. and then where do we move we move to the five uh five seven chord five seven chord yeah we move to the five so this is this is also harmony, right? Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. And then and that's all C minor again. You know? And then it goes back to five again for the And then it part. goes back to five again for the next one, yeah. Cool. So, you know, the, the, the harmony is, 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 is at work here 
Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, take, like, for example, Haydn's Surprise Symphony, G major, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this is G major. It's arpeggio, basically. Yeah, it's right? just an arpeggio. And the response is going to be uh, an arpeggio of the 5-7. Mm -hmm. Right? You know, and... There's even a 5-7 chord in there. Right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Now, so, but in this case, we wouldn't call that a transposition because the first time he's going up, the second time he's going down. Yeah, that would not be a transposition. We'll be, it'll be something we'll be talking about later on, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, like we, a, but like, we're, we're, we're really referring to the harmonic content, right? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the point is harmony is always there. Mm -hmm. You're always dealing with harmony. Yeah. You know? um, the harmony and melody are not two separate things. As we said earlier, they actually affect each other and interplay with one another. Indeed. So. Indeed. That satisfies my curiosity about that. Good. <laughs> now on to variations. Variation. So a varied repetition or a variation involves the same melodic framework with some slight adjustments, uh, adding embellishments, uh, simplifications, changing rhythms, mm -hmm. uh, something like that. So it's basically just repeating but not repeating exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so example. Example. I mean, maybe maybe there's, there's a lot of other things you can do to vary. And actually, the things you might do to vary them are all the other things we're going to be discussing. Right. You yeah, know? absolutely. Expansion, um, contraction, that kind of if stuff. I'm just to improvise for a minute, you know. Ready? You know, I mean, imagine if Hein had... Mm-hmm. Nice, dude. Right, yeah. So I've just added a little embellishment. Uh-huh. Right, you know. Passing tones between the notes, the original notes. Yep, yep, exactly. And it did sound more interesting. It, it did, it did. In fact, there's a whole type of music in classical music called theme and variations, where people just show off their ability to take a theme and, and vary it indefinitely, mm -hmm. right? You know, just one iteration after another of, of variations on the same theme. And that's theme and variation. And that's the theme and variation. That's, that's is that is that known as a part or a section of music sometimes or what? It's usually a larger form. It's considered you know sort of this uh, analogous in size to sonata or rondo or something like that. <laughs> that's right. We talked about larger forms, didn't we? We did. <laughs> <laughs> I think we talked about theme and variation. We may have. Yeah. <laughs> Cobwebs, bat cobwebs. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. We have done a lot of these at <laughs> this point. So variation. There you have it. And yeah. So again, the ways you can change a melody, yeah. embellish it, simplify it, reduce it, yeah. uh, complicate it, you it know, like you just did. Absolutely. Very good. Absolutely. Now let's talk about the melodic sequence. Let's talk about the melodic sequence. I might need you to translate this definition that I got from this here. Yeah, this gets confusing, but never worry. Uh, it, uh, like many things in theory, it's probably not as hard as it sounds when you read a textbook. Mm -hmm. They like the big words. They, they do. Um, so a melodic sequence involves several immediate restatements of a musical theme or segment. Uh, these segments and repetitions generally move by step. Mm -hmm. So they'll move a step up or they'll move a step down, but that same intervallic pattern will still be there. Okay, the same... Um, Pattern of, if you're doing it steps, whole steps and half steps. Yeah. Right. Uh, it is, in fact, a melodic sequence. Uh, remember that little example I played a minute ago in D minor? Right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, we went... Or whatever we did. Mm -hmm. When we got to this point, this is actually a melodic sequence going down. Right? Yeah, you hear yep. that a lot. You hear that an awful lot. It's a it's a it's a certain motive of music. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, usually a, a little fragment like that. A fragment that repeats as it moves down. Yeah, backs back up, back down, back up, back down, kind of thing. Yeah, that kind of thing. That's yeah. a sequence, huh? That is that is called a melodic sequence, and they have the effect of making your your uh, harmony and chords go all weird. So the the functions will kind of start to not make sense uh -huh. because the the logic of that sequence 
sort of overpowers the logic of function. Uh -huh. And if you're analyzing the chords, you'll start thinking, wow, these chords don't make any sense, right? Mm -hmm. But it's because the chords don't have to make sense. It's the sequence that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Right? So they have this uh, ability of sort of messing with that. It makes them really good for like if you're changing key or something, you know, makes it really a gray area where you can change key really, really easily. I see. I see. Yeah. Kind of adds a little bit of a, like a whirlwind to the to the chaos, like a little chaos to it. Yeah. I yeah. Know, I'm sure Beethoven and Bach did this very quickly. Oh yeah, Bach, it, it, uh, Bach did it all over the place. Yeah, you you can't you can't find a, a Bach fugue from from the uh, book of Preludes and Fugues. It doesn't have a melodic sequence in it somewhere. Now I understand that this is referring to the melodic sequence. This occurs within one voice. Generally, now I'm I, I it's called an imitation when it's in, in another voice. Have you ever heard that one before? Oh yeah, sure. That's a that's a Baroque. Uh, kind of fugue kind of idea. It's actually older than that, but 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 we think of so. Um, uh, oh gosh, let's hear sequence versus imitation. Um, okay, so sequence we, we just heard, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, or you know, um, oh, sorry, all right, let's do something simpler than that. Yeah. Sequence. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Oh, even going back down, you did a sequence. I did a different one. Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, so, um, that's a sequence. So, that's a sequence. Okay. Okay. I'm going to do this. I'm mm -hmm. going to play a, I'm going to play a Bach fugue. You're kidding me. A, a little bit, but. <laughs> imitation and this other voice comes in playing the same thing mm, i think i think i need you to talk that out while you're, i just okay. heard, i just heard music just there. yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> so um when i got to the end of this so um, what, are, what is, are you, is this all um yeah see how in, in my left hand here i did the same thing yeah, mm -hmm. I did that, yeah. While my, the other hand continued. Oh, like yeah. a rounds? Yes, like rounds. Uh, the round is a form of in imitation. Uh -huh. A cannon is a form of imitation. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, and a fugue is a form of imitation. But it's it's where, like, maybe the bass would cut off or go off and do something else, and then the tenor or another voice above it, yeah. or whatever voices are involved, yeah. would go ahead and sing what they just did. Yes. And then move on from there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So, one more time with that Bach example. Oh, gosh, you're, really, you're killing me, man. All right, let's see. <laughs> Your idea. <laughs> it was my idea. Why do I do this myself? Uh -huh. Towards the end, that's yeah. that's when it all took off. When the yeah, basically at the very end of what you just did. Yeah, and if I was the, any kind of real pianist, I would. This voice actually does it, all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But wow, but yeah. I'm I'm not pianist enough to do that. Sorry, you're yeah. going to have to hire a pro to. So, but but yeah. All right, so I got uh, three other kinds of sequences here. Yeah, tonal, real, and modified. So. Uh, we touched on this a little bit. Uh, tonal sequence, you know, the intervals you're playing um, chain, uh, uh, gets adjusted to stay in the key, basically. Mm -hmm. So if we think about happy birthday, right? Uh huh. This is an example of a tonal sequence, sort of. Right? And we get a minor second. Uh huh. And that's a major second. Uh huh. Right? So the last two notes. The last two notes are major second. Uh huh. You know, we've adjusted from minor to major 
to stay in the key we're in. I see. You know, to stay in D major, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, because the, the first one was G to F sharp, and that second one was A to G. Mm -hmm. You know, a real sequence by comparison. Ah. Yeah, because we're preserving the minor second. Uh-huh, those right? last two notes, yeah. Yeah, we're preserving the actual quality of that interval as we transpose up rather than, uh, rather than adjust for key. So that's a real, so tonal sequence is when you, you honor the, the key signature and the scale that you're in. Mm, yes. And make adjustments accordingly. Right. And then in the real sequence, you're honoring the intervals. The interval structure, yeah. Strictly. Yes. And that and that often invites chromaticism. That often invites chromaticism, yeah. Okay, then what about the modified sequence? Uh, it's just when re, uh, restatements are not exact. Uh, some of the intervals may have been expanded or, or, or contracted compared to the original. Hmm. It's, it's just sort of a catch-all. Hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um... Right? That last time, that last interval was just kind of made bigger. Uh-huh. Right? Because I wanted to, yeah, nominally, you know, uh, theoretically. Okay. Yeah. So let me make sure I got this. So, so rather than a pattern being slightly altered to honor a key, or chromaticism, chromaticism being added to honor, honor a pattern. Yeah. In this case, in the case of the modified sequence, this is messing with the intervals within the pattern. Yeah. Oftentimes. Yeah. Yeah. That's me messing with the pattern itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. All right. So we that's the sequences. That's the melodic sequence. That, that's it, yeah. And yeah. those are extraordinarily useful, by the way. Now we have another technique called yep. the change of mode. The change of mode. And uh, I got an example for this one, but why don't you let us know what, uh, what we're talking about here, Matt? Uh, we stay in the key, but maybe move to a different mode. For example, if the original is in G major, we may play it in G minor. Mm -hmm. Same letter name, different mode. I mean, you know, I mean, listen to how depressing this is. Yeah. Joy, uh, dreadful, dreadful. Yeah. Oh, 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 to joylessness, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, dude. I love it. I love it. Well, I was yeah. going to do a similar thing here. You know, it's a uh, happy, we all know, we, we talked about happy birthday already, right? Right, right, yeah. And I have my octave mandolin here. <laughs> People are going to feel a few years older by the time they're done with this episode because they'll have heard <laughs> happy birthday so many times. <laughs> but yeah, we're, G, we're in G major this time, so... Yep. If you do it in a major, of course, we have the... Uh-huh. And so on. Yep. But if you want to change modes, we go to G minor, right? Right. That should be a D minor, but it's kind of <laughs> a little F heavy. But you get the idea, kind of yeah. what, like what you're doing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And again, this is this can be very, very useful. Now, I do have a little problem with something here, Matt. Oh yeah. The description when they're saying, in in the, well in the book, uh, Frank Hooley said something along the lines of uh, the same key, but uh, different mode. But I mean, would you say that G minor and G major are the same key? I mean, they have the same tonic. Is there a better way to say that? Yeah, that's a little confusing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, don't 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 let that textbook confuse you. G minor and G major are not the same key. I, he really should have used the word tonic. Same tonic, same different tonic, mode. Different mode. Yeah, mm. yeah. So we're going to clarify that. Yeah, I'm, and I'm glad we did. Okay, cool. No, G G major and G minor are not the same key. <laughs> <laughs> Just At all. <laughs> different, different flavors of G. Different flavors of G. All right, man. Well, that that uh, that makes sense for the change in mode, and I guess you can do that with any mode you want to. You know, go Lydian if you want to go Lydian. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Go, uh, what was that crazy one? Uh, Locrian? Locrian, yeah. Go yeah. Locrian. Go Loco. Go. <laughs> now, fragmentation. Uh, yeah. Uh, Again, uh, a very, very popular. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think of good examples off the top of my head. But, um, so, I mean, if your melody... Yeah, that's your main melody. Mm -hmm. And 
within that melody is a whole lot of stuff we've already discussed, right? Repetition and, and mm -hmm. transposition, et cetera, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. um, what is yeah. this melody? Is this just yours? Uh, this is uh, the A minor from uh, Box uh, Two part counterpoints. Uh, what, what did he call it? Two part inventions. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but. Uh, if we were. Um, right? And then. Right? Mm -hmm. And I'm just focusing on that one little part of this. Uh, Right mm -hmm. or whatever that 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 was trash. I would not use that, but but you get the idea. I'm, I'm focusing on that single part of that melody and and working with that, and that is just fragmentation. So a composer is basically taking a small part of an established melody mm -hmm. and then bringing it back later on, independent of the melody. Right. Yeah. Uh, to to offer it into or to bring it into another. Yeah. Uh, what did you call it? Uh, uh, a different sort of domain function. Yeah. yeah, think about the development of sonata form. This is the kind of thing that always happens, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then the fragment, the fragment might be simply repeated in its true form, or could actually be reinterpreted by any of these things we've discussed so far. Absolutely. Like yeah, I'm, I'm taking that melody and transposing it up mm -hmm. badly. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah. All right. So fragments. That's fragmentation. Yes. Anything else you want to say about that? That was a very short one. Um. You hear it more often than you think, mm -hmm. uh, especially in in uh, in film music. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, you should you should do a drinking game for every time you hear in Star Wars. Yeah, right. right? It's not just in that primary melody, right? It's not just whenever you hear the Imperial Death March. I mean, yeah, you know, um, uh, it, it sneaks in at the end of Anakin's big rant. You know, not just the men, but the women and the children too. When you talk about he killed all the sand people, uh -huh. you know, when he when he says the line "I hate them," you hear Ooh. that little fragment yeah. of that melody, right? Uh -huh. Is is there? Love it. Star Wars does. It's kind of like, love kind of Star Wars. Peter and the Wolf. You know, every 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 character kind of has their own theme. Yeah. And sometimes if they're in the same room, sometimes the themes intermingle. Yeah. Or with the sim similar topics or whatever. Yeah. Uh, in uh, Phantom Menace, when at the end, when Yoda is talking about Anakin, it says, uh, "It says grave danger in the boy's training." You hear that same. Yeah, that same <laughs> little ode to what's going to happen, right? I now I need to go back and listen to all, watch, oh, yeah. watch all these Star Wars. Oh, yeah, again. man. Oh, man. I could write a whole paper Just on John Williams. Things. John Williams is brilliant. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, yeah. No complaints on John. We talk about him a lot, actually. We do talk about him a lot. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's where it gets a little weird. Uh, yeah, this is where it gets a little weird. It's about to get weird. Yeah. Okay. Intervallic expansion and contraction. Yeah. That's not so weird. It's going to get weirder. Yeah. But it's a big word. Yeah. Um, so it's just the idea of, really it's just the idea of not being super bound by exactly the intervals you played. Mm -hmm. you know, but rather the general shape of, the me of, of what you played. The contour of the, the melody. The contour of the melody. So if we take a really famous one... Um, So we've got this this first leap. This is a really big octave leap, right? Yeah. This is an octave. Second leap is just a major six. Hmm. It's got the same kind of feel, that kind of same kind of big leap feel, right? Mm -hmm. But we have contracted it. It's yeah. just a little bit smaller. Okay. Because we don't care, right? Because <laughs> we 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 want to we want to be here now. Uh huh. You know, and so rather than rather than getting in being involved in, well, you know, do I have to melodic sequence this or, or transpose this interval or something? We've just shrunk it, right? But it, but that same general contour, that large leap, is still present. Huh? Yeah. So that that is basically uh, the idea of contraction. Okay. Right. Um, an being interval. Smaller. Yeah, an interval being uh, expanded. Right? Mm -hmm. 
Perfect fourth up from C the first time, perfect fifth up from C the second time. Hmm. And I'm using repetition too, right? Yes. I mean, I could keep going. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Half cadence. Mm. Yeah, so I'm just composing over here now. <laughs> This is the process. Yeah, you guys right. are witnessing a live process <laughs> of composition. Here. Absolutely, right? Yeah, and and this is what you know Beethoven in those sketchbooks would do. He'd go over and over until he got it exactly the way he wanted it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so like you said, when you're making the interval smaller, you're contracting, contracting. and mm-hmm. expanding when it's making it larger. Yeah, and I noticed in the example you gave, all the melodic content up until those two notes were the same. Yeah. And that's the repetition we're talking that's about. The, that's, that's repetition, so. yeah. All of these become little building blocks with which you create melodies and themes. Absolutely. Uh. <laughs> now, inversion. Oh, shoot. Okay, so inversion is taking the intervals of the melody and turning them upside down. So if I went a major second up, I will go a major second down. If I then went a... A uh, major third up, I will go a major third down. And then if I, after that, went a perfect fifth up, I would go a perfect fifth down, et cetera, et cetera, until you get this kind of um, kind of uh, negative image version of, of, the, uh, of the original melody. Yes, there was a, there was a, um, a mirror kind of analogy or a uh, mirror metaphor used in one of the texts I was reading. Yeah. And I got confused about that because... There's two ways you can hold a mirror to something. Right. We're talking about on the horizontal axis. It's sort of, yeah. It's sort of more like your reflection in a lake. A reflection in a lake. You look at a yeah. mountain going over a lake and you see it on the underside. Yep. It's following the exact same thing. Yeah. You know, same pattern yeah. upside down. So one example, obviously, we've heard happy birthday before. Yes. And I sat there and it was a bit of a process, Matt. I sat there. <laughs> I believe it. First off, I, I had to notate happy birthday to have a look Number at one. It, which, uh, that was okay. It didn't take too long. But then the process involved me going and taking the first interval and and just doing everything, in, like you said, like inverted yep. and in reverse. And I ran into a couple of problems that we talked about, but we'll talk about that in a second. In the meantime, you all know happy birthday. Now. In the inverted version of this, you're going to hear the same rhythms. Right. But you're going to hear a little bit of a difference. Mm -hmm. Stand by. Happy birthday, inverted. Yeah. So There you go. The problem that I ran into, Matt, if you recall, was... uh, when you when you have an interval, for example, a perfect fifth up, right, and then you invert it, normally that would be a perfect fourth down. But in this case, it's a perfect fifth down. We're actually doing a perfect fifth down, so yeah. you're you're keeping all the lines and spaces to count. Yep, proper. Yeah, right. So it, it got weird for me when I was trying <laughs> to do that. Inversions can be weird. Now, along with inversion, we have a similar thing called retrograde. Right. And uh, Bach was all over this kind of stuff. Inversions. So they say, yeah. Or Beethoven, maybe. Oh, it would be Bach that was really all into this. Okay, definitely Bach. Yep. Now, in the the case of retrograde, we're talking a mirror's image as if you're holding it vertically up against the page. It's the melody backwards. So it's almost as if you took a snapshot of something and then flipped it, reversed the snapshot. Yeah, it is the melody backwards. So if I play the retrograde version of Happy Birthday... I'm pretty sure you won't you're not gonna recognize it. I'm certain. <laughs> Dig it. Happy birthday, retrograde. <laughs> kinda like it. <laughs> I kinda like it. That might be the bumper music, actually. We'll see. We'll see. But that's interesting, isn't it? Yes, yeah. I, to me, there, there's a level of um, attention and mm-hmm. detail that uh, Beethoven and Bach put into these fugues and stuff like that. Imagine Bach very famously just 
just to see if he could, I suppose, just messing around one day, would write fugues, uh, would write two-part counterpoint in which the 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 lower part was the retrograde of the upper part <laughs> and they would and and they would conform to all the laws of counterpoint and mm. and everything and 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 fit perfectly he just created a melody that he could then retrograde and create a counter melody for can't believe it i yeah, i know right it's it's amazing that's like a yeah that's another level that know. is another level <laughs> that really is and it all happens so fast are you really even, i mean were the only people really knowing what's going on? Would it be people actually reading the music? You know what I mean? Who knows? Uh, I mean, I, I have a hard time imagining that. I really do. Knowing that, you mm-hmm. know, keeping that. Uh, so, so yeah, it, probably. It's almost like his inside joke. <laughs> it's almost like his inside joke. Hey, yeah. me, look what I did. Yeah. You know? Well, yeah, but the people playing it would definitely, because what he would do, he would have the treble clef at the beginning, mm-hmm. right? And then at the end, he had the treble clef upside down. <laughs> so what he does is like turn the paper upside down, and then this, the other person play that. Oh my god! Yeah, and that would actually might end up being the retrograde inversion, actually. It, but but yeah, and and that would be, and they could play it together, and it would be the it would, it would work. Hmm. It sounds like music, but the yeah. process that it takes to get you there is so non musical in my opinion, <laughs> so non creative in my opinion. Oh, just wait until you get into set theory and you're talking about inversion along an axis and, yeah. and things like this, and it gets it gets deep. It I, gets deep. I said non creative, but there's got to be a better word. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, non subconscious. How about that? This is not <laughs> this is not a subconscious. Like, oh, this is this melody sounds good and I like it. You know, this is this is. Plotted out, right? The muses didn't just breathe that into their fingers. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> That's a, yeah. <laughs> okay, so you want to move on then? Yes. Now, really, uh, retrograde and inversion are the, they're easy to wrap your mind around the concept, but the, yeah. for the execution, as far as the execution is concerned, it's very daunting. It can be a little more challenging. Yeah. Okay, so moving on then. Now we have. Um, Augmentation and dim- diminution. And Dimin- diminution. Diminution. Right. So this is this is the note length aspect of variation. Okay. Right. So uh, this is you know instead of uh, going, which would be augmentation. Mm-hmm. You no, know, I've increased the rhythmic value of every one of those. The note length. The uh, note values. Yeah. Uh, or versus, if my original melody is, I'm in a Star Wars mood. Yeah, that's all right. You know, I'm sure so, John and Williams will be cool with all this. Uh, instead of doing that, going, yeah, uh huh, shortening the rhythmic values. Okay, uh, which is diminution. So with expansion and contraction, we're talking about intervals. Mm. With augmentation and diminution, diminution, we're talking about lengths of note values. Exactly. How long you hold the note, how short you hold the note. Exactly. And uh, that technique is used a lot as well. Yes. And then I've heard pieces where someone is playing the melody, maybe in the bass, slower. Yep. And then quicker in several times in the higher part. Yeah. Well, we mentioned Beethoven's Fifth. That absolutely happens there. That happens there. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. All right, now phrase extension. Phrase extension is kind of a new, um, new topic here. Yeah, isn't we, it? Yeah, because sorry, once you've got your melody constructed, mm-hmm. you got to start thinking about the phrase structure, mm-hmm. right? But you can make your phrases a little more interesting in some ways. Okay. One of them is is to sort of extend the phrase by adding a melodic fragment to the end of it. Uh, typically constructed using some of the developmental techniques we've discussed. Mm-hmm. Um, so phrase extensions, there's there's kind of three main types, right? There's three yeah. main ways you can do this. Yeah. Uh, what is, so the first one being the, um, well, I guess taking in whatever order you want to. Yeah. But the main, the main being initial at the beginning, cadential at the end, yep. and interpolation in the middle. Right, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, if I'm just to make up a melody here. And that's a half cadence, right? Mm-hmm. Um, right. Pretty, pretty typical. Two right? periods making a phrase. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, I can extend this phrase at the end by adding some uh, some new material. Uh, right. 
that was the extension. Yeah, yeah. That yeah, that stuff at the end. Um I can also expand it in the middle. And then and instead of just going back, I'm going to expand here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you sandwiched it. Yeah, kind of sandwiched it. Between the two kind of uh, sandwiched it, yeah. periods. Yeah, and I can do it at the beginning. So you actually took that at the very beginning before at, at the, beginning the, of the melody, whole thing yeah. started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, and I, I could do all of these. Uh, kind of starting to sound like a melody at that point, isn't it? <laughs> but, but this would be the kind of thing you've done after you've established the actual melody? Sometimes, or is this? Yeah, because otherwise it's just a part of the melody, isn't it? Otherwise, yeah. But or a lot theme? of what we're talking about here is how do we construct these melodies, uh-huh. right? And sort of sandwiching that new material in between the repetitions of those things is part of how that melody gets constructed in the first place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you can think about it as something that happens to the melody later, mm-hmm. and that that's certainly something that happens to melodies later is this kind of expansion. Um, or extension, rather. Uh, but you can also think of it as how do you go about writing melodies anyway? Because now, you know, if, if my original idea, which it was, was... You know, and I think that's not that great a melody, right? <laughs> ain't bad. So, I mean, it isn't bad, but it's a little bland, right? Uh-huh. You know, if I'm now going... You know, you know, and I've expanded a little bit. Now I've got a set of better sounding melody, right? And you've got that little jump in it, you know, and the little dip at the end. It's a little more exciting, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. So a lot of what we're talking about is actually how do you get exciting melodies to begin with? How do you get good melodies to begin with? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and these are the techniques by which we do that. So in terms of phrase extension, what we just listened to was... Um, we have an initial extension when is when it when it happens at the beginning. Yep. I have a question about that. Would a pickup measure be considered an initial extension? Uh possibly. I mean, you're kind of arguing semantics at that point. Uh-huh. You know. I mean, I guess you technically could call it that, but 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 why? What do you, you know, it's too much. Too yeah, much. I mean, you know, you're not really Enhancing your understanding of melodic construction, you know, by parsing out that kind of stuff, I, I don't think. But but you could call it call it that, sure. Well, I do. I, I don't want to be busting out the wrong terms here. Yeah. <laughs> and another cool term I learned, by the way, for the pickup measure, which I didn't, I never knew, which I never heard. Yeah. The anacrusic. The anacrusis. Anacrusis. Have you yeah, heard that? Yeah, that's the fancy word for pickup. <laughs> nice, huh? <laughs> yeah. And so and so that's that's when you so the initial extension is when you put it in the beginning of it. Yeah, and then if you when when you sandwich it in the middle of it or somewhere within the body of the uh, melody, yeah, that's what we call a internal extension. Yeah, or an interpolation. Yes. Okay, and then finally, when you end it uh, with the extension, we call that a cadential extension. Well, uh, the thing with cadential extensions mm-hmm. uh, that we should uh, point out is the cadential extensions involve harmony. Mm-hmm. When you finally get to your. Uh, mm-hmm. thing at the end uh, a cadential extension is going to because because I did five to one there mm-hmm. right uh, uh, then a cadential extension is going to occur after that and then kind of go five one five one again mm-hmm. um, so That's a cadential extension. Just sort of hammering out that uh, that cadence a couple of more times, you know, for the sake of emphasis, I suppose, you know. So Haydn was a big fan of this, right? Oh, gosh, yeah. I know we had some listeners who wanted to keep us in history here a little bit, so. Yeah, yeah. That During that period, uh, Haydn's period, which was what, uh, bar- was that Baroque? Or was that was the classical? early classical Early period. classical. The 5-1 was still the big old thing. It was a big The big deal. old thing, yeah. Beethoven would, too, Mozart too. So they would end a song with five, one, yeah, five, one. Oh yeah, five. and then maybe the final one would be a perfect authentic cadence. Yeah, I I analyzed a Mozart piece, uh, just uh, just recently that, that ends with. Uh, 
And then, um, and then Lydia goes. <laughs> yeah. I feel like there should have been one more. Ah, yes. There we go. There we go. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, th- th- this was, this is a big thing in the classical period. Very, very, very big thing. But, uh, cadences in the Romantic era do tend to be more like what we call alighted cadences. Mm-hmm. So the end of one thing is the, the same time, the beginning of another. So you get less of these cadential extensions. Interesting. Right? Yeah, and, and the music tends to flow smoothly from one phrase to the next. Um, more than the, the highly structured and, and, and highly obvious uh, authentic cadences that end parts of, of uh, classical pieces, Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven pieces. And, and those would often... You know, um, have cadential extensions that follow to sort of help further emphasize the finality of that cadence. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then people did other things too, like maybe they would do a five to six, a deceptive cadence, and then do a five sure. to one. Sure, you know? Two, five, one, two, five, one, instead of just five, one, five, one. Yeah. Or how about or, this? How about the plagal cadence? Because you, you already gave it a five, one, but then you do a four, one? The, yeah. The amen cadence? Let's hear yeah. that real quick. So, um, the plagal cadence is a four to one cadence. Um. That sounded very Handel to me. That sounded like straight out of the Hallelujah Chorus, right? For context, can you actually give us a one, four, five or something? So Sorry. We, <laughs> yes, okay. Coming on so, a five chord, uh, what's wrong right. with you? C major. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Moving our cadence. Um, yeah. Five. One. Five, one. I'll go home and then we all go home yeah, yeah. there you go beautiful <laughs> but that's just another example of a cadential extension yes and i'm just making sure that i'm i'm that's that's proper that's correct yes plagal cadence can be a cadential extension yes yes now sometimes the cadential cadence is lengthened to a into a like on a longer edition known as the codetta Right, yeah, you get into the words codetta and coda, and you're starting to talk about form, mm-hmm. larger form more than the construction of the melody at this point. Which is also what we're talking to as, as far as phrase extensions are concerned, right? Yeah, right, right, yeah, yeah. Um, what is the difference between a cadential extension and a codetta? Well, mm-hmm. in my mind, a codetta is going to be a more involved chord progression. It's not going to be just 5 1, 5 1, or even 4 5 1, 4 5 1. It's going to be, you know, 1 4, 2 6 5, cadential 6 4, 5 7, 1, mm-hmm. you know, at, at the very least, right? It's, it's going to be a, a section of music that went around a few things itself. Possibly right? inter- introducing some new harmonies. Possibly introducing some new harmonies, mm-hmm. and quite possibly introducing some new kind of melodic fragment or something like that. Yeah. Whereas where a uh, coda, same thing. A coda is a whole separate piece of music, often, right? Okay. It's going to be a whole. It, it, it's going to have its own phrases and its own kind of things, often, right? So you could say that a, a phrase extension is the simple, simple, smaller version, more with probably within a phrase or periods, you know. Yeah. And the uh, codetta is yes. usually a bit longer than that. <laughs> Usually, I, I, yeah, I'm reluctant to, to get into length here yeah. because you can have really short codettas you know, okay. and really long cadential extensions. It is usually longer, but the, the main thing is is, is going to be more involved chord progression-wise and phrase-wise. Uh, so um, regarding the codetta and the coda, mm. is that the only difference between these two terms? One is longer, one is shorter? That is absolutely not the difference between those two terms. Okay. The codetta ends... A section of the work. Mm-hmm. So if you're in Rondo, the codetta might end the A section before you go to the B section. Aha. Uh-huh. Right? Or it might end the exposition of a sonata form. Mm-hmm. Uh, a coda ends the entire piece of music, the entire movement or uh, the, the entire piece of music itself. It comes at the very end of everything. Yeah. That is the difference between a codetta and a coda. Mm-hmm. Um, when my students say a codetta is shorter than a coda, I throw erasers at them. <laughs> this is this is a this is a nitpicky point of mine because it's just it's just not true. It has nothing to do with length. It has to do with how much music you are ending here. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's better than the markers, I think. <laughs> they well, yeah. Well, I don't know. And some of those erasers for the for the uh, 
dry erase boards, those things are kind of hard. You know, the corner hits you in the head just right. You know, <laughs> that's going that. to that's smart. Kill somebody. <laughs> well, he was wrong about Curdettas. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm telling you, it's a, it's, a, it's a thing with me. It's a thing. I'm glad we clarified that <laughs> because, uh, yeah, on paper, the Codetta just looks like it'd be a small. Uh, yeah, well, it is. Uh, well, yeah, it, coda. it, Codetta it, it's Italian for little Coda, right? Mm -hmm. You think, oh, well, it's just smaller. It has nothing to do with length. Mm -hmm. Nothing to do with length. So not only do we use Italian for some of these terms, but some of them just don't even make sense in Italian. Yeah, they don't even make sense in Italian. <laughs> One more question about these uh, phrase extensions, huh? Okay. Let's go back to the interpolation. Okay. Why would we do something like that, Matt? And uh, so. Uh, because it is interesting. Adds um, a little bit of drama, maybe a little bit of color. Adds a little bit of drama, adds a little bit of color, adds a little bit of excitement. Go back and listen to any sonata form by Mozart. Mm -hmm. And we know what sonata form is. You know, we did a whole podcast on that. Yeah. Go back and listen to that. The recapitulation will almost always have some little thing stuck in the middle that was not there in the exposition. Mm -hmm. There's just this new piece of, you know, Mozart, it was, he's notorious for just coming up with new material all the time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and there'd be this kind of new material stuck in there that, that just it, it extended the recapitulation, made it more exciting. It was, it was more interesting to hear something new than to trot over the same old ground, you mm -hmm. know? And, and uh, yeah, that, that kind of internal extension and interpolation Happens very often in Mozart sonatas. Uh, it was also mentioned that it kind of um, it can break the balance of predictability. Break the balance of predictability. That's a good term. Yeah. If you're like, uh, as far as the lengths of the periods, are you just used to yeah. every eight bars being a period and yeah, every eight like bars come on, man. Yeah. Gets old. You gets old, right? Analyze that in your sleep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or you can hear it when I mean, when it's like all that eight measure stuff is like you can just hear, you know, the different sections of things. And yeah, it gets a little old. Yeah. And speaking of recap recapitulations. Speaking of recapitulations. I think it's time for the recap. I think it is. Again, today's discussion was uh, melodic development techniques. Right, yeah. And um, along with that, we're talking about thematic development. We're talking about thematic, motivic, melodic development. Yeah. yeah. What are some ways we can do that? Repetition and transposition. Repetition and transposition. So taking a, a little motivic fragment and repeating it. Mm -hmm. Literally. Literally. Verbatim. Verbatim. Or repeating it at a different pitch level. Mm -hmm. Transposition. Yeah. Yeah. And then variation. Variation. Um, making slight adjustments, embellishments, adding a couple of notes, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. And you can use any of the techniques we're talking about to vary something, right? You absolutely. Can expansion, contraction. Yeah, absolutely. Diminution absolutely. Diminution and all that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, melodic sequence. Involves taking that fragment and moving it either up or down by step. Mm hmm Oh. Essentially. Yeah. Okay. And then we talked about the tonal sequence being we we each restatement honors the key or the scale involved. Right. We adjust whether it's major, minor, augmented, or diminished, these intervals, uh, to, to stay in the same key. So it might be that the whole step, half step patterns will be altered during this process. Uh, it will be. Yeah. yeah. And then in the real sequence, it's the opposite. We uh, keep those sacrosanct and, and sort of mess with the key. We keep the um, intervals sacrosanct mm -hmm. and add chromatis, thereby adding chromaticism. Right, thereby creating chromaticism. Messing, yeah, moving dishonoring out of the, key. the key, honoring the interval, interval right. patterns. Exactly. And then we had the modified sequence. Yeah, which is just changing it. So that's the default word for messing with it in some way. <laughs> <laughs> like it, like it. Eh, change in mode. Change in mode, pretty straightforward. Mm, major to minor or minor to Dorian or... What have you. Play the same thing in a different mode. Yep. Add however many accidentals you need to to make it a different feel, different mood, different mode. Absolutely. Yep. Fragmentation. Uh, taking a, a tiny section of your original melody and playing with that for a little while. Yeah. Maybe make it resurface later on in the piece independent of the original yeah. uh, establishment of the melody or the yeah. theme. Yeah. 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 And then maybe take that and grow on it. Maybe take that and vary it. And will. And will. Yeah. And should. Mm-hmm. Okay, intervallic expansion and contraction, just like it sounds, huh? Yeah, take some of those uh, intervals and make them bigger or smaller. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> These are very simple. Very you really <laughs> We're not playing any examples on the recap. Go back and listen for the whole thing. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm done playing. Yeah, I'm done. I, 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 have, I have butchered this piano enough. Today. I intentionally didn't want to make you sit there and do an inversion. 
Yeah, well, I wouldn't. And why is that? What's an inversion? So an inversion is taking every one of those intervals and basically inverting them. So if it went a major second up, go a major second down, et cetera, et cetera, until you get a sort of upside down version of the melody. And to and to see this in action, take a mirror, not literally, <laughs> but yeah, it's like it's more of a lake, uh, a mountain over a lake, the contour of a mountain right. over a lake. Uh, yeah. The horizontal mirror image. Right, right. Whereas a vertical mirror image would be... The melody backwards. Which we call... A retrograde. A retrograde. And to me, that was the hardest thing to do. For some reason. No, no. I think the inversion was harder. I think the inversion was probably harder, yeah. yeah absolutely. And then we have augmentation and diminution. Yep. Uh, sh- lengthening or shortening the note, the rhythmic note values, making the notes longer or shorter. Can I just say something else about this? Mm-hmm. You have an augmented note or an interval Mm -hmm. that means you're making the interval bigger okay you have a diminished interval that means you're making the interval smaller yes i think they should have called i think they (laughs) they should should have switched it yeah (laughs) well the term augmentation and diminution actually goes all the way back to the middle ages Uh uh-huh so so they should have called it intervalic augmentation and diminution yeah and then just called the other thing rhythmic or rhythmic expansion and contraction or something yeah they could have switched these uh, oh, and we can't make it too easy for you. I mean, come on. No, no. <laughs> Gotta think you give you what you paid for if you're trying to get that degree. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but now that we've kind of gone off on that, I hope, that, I hope people now know the difference. Yep, rant Expa- over. Expansion and contraction, intervals, augmentation, diminution, note values. Yes. Yeah. Okay, you make it longer, shorter notes. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you that they could have just switched those and, and, and made it easier, but you know. Thank you. <laughs> And then we get into a different thing. Now, that, that everything we just discussed was m- melodic-oriented, right? M- Melody-oriented, melody yeah. Oriented. This is a little bit more harmony-oriented. Yeah. Uh, with phrase extension, when we uh, extend a phrase by adding a melodic fragment to the end of it, mm-hmm. uh, you typically constructed by using some of the developmental techniques heretofore mentioned, right? Variation, repetition, transposition, inversion, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then... Um, then what? And then uh, we, we kind of talked about three main types of extensions. You know, we have the initial extension. Right. In which the the, the material occurs before even the presentation of the period or yep. the phrase or whatever. Yeah. And then, but this is often done later on in the piece, right? When they have already established the true phrase. Yeah. Or. That's one version of it. Yeah. Okay. But it does happen other in other circumstances? Abs- yeah. Okay, good. Okay, just to clarify. <laughs> and then we have interpolation, which is more of an internal extension. Like we're talking about, you have a, a maybe two periods that make up a phrase, but you stick this right in between the two periods. Right, yeah. yeah. Or stick this in the middle of one of the two phrases. Or anywhere, really, it, within really? the body of yeah. the uh, phrase. Right, yeah. And that would be called an interpolation or an internal extension. Right. And then finally, we have the cadential extensions. Right, the five one five one five one. Yeah, the crazy, uh, the kind yeah. of bearing it, uh, bearing it. Um, yeah, really just, uh, yeah, driving it home, so to speak. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and there's a few different ways you could do that. You could do that with plagal cadence, deceptive cadence, ultimately sure. ending with the 5-1, ideally yep. perfect, authentic cadence. Right. And then we talked about the coda versus codetta, which yeah. are also kind of extensions, are they not? These are Yeah, extensions. they're kind of extensions. Yeah, burn off some energy. The uh, codetta mm-hmm. being that it, uh, you're not, you're gonna let me try and get this, aren't you, Matt? Yes. <laughs> Did I get my eraser handy? I'm I don't, there, I don't have one. I'm sitting there waiting for you to come in and interrupt. Okay, no, the codetta is, uh, is, uh, it can happen really anywhere within the piece, but it's all, it's basically a phrase extension that's more involved than a phrase extension. More involved than a cadential extension. A cadential extension. Yes. Right. And it typically ends a section of a work, the A section. Or we go into the B section, for example, or any section. But the code, the coda itself, is is um, strictly reserved for the end of the piece, the end of the entire work. Yes, and it can sometimes be it can be a full section within itself, or at least some of Beethoven's codas were longer than the actual piece. Seriously, no. Yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah, ha. oh yeah. I've seen it myself. It All happened. Right. Ludwig van, what you he's, doing? He's he's a, he's a little crazy. He's a little nuts. What can you do? Yeah, man. So, so much great music comes from the crazies. Oh, the yeah. crazy ones. <laughs> uh, look at rock and roll. Oh, yeah. 
All of which, I mean, these, you know, these, I mean, we've been talking a lot about classical music, but these, these techniques are used in, in rock and roll melodies and in guitar solos, See, you know, and the things too, right? Let me say, I wish I had said this earlier. Go back and listen to this episode again with the, with the soloing in mind. With guitar solos in mind, yeah. Because a lot of what a guitar solo, soloist will do is actually take the melody that, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the hook or the melody yeah. and literally riff on it. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, changing it up and making it more interesting. And, you know, yeah. so that's, um, to me, that's a big part of writing melodies on a fly. As a bass player, I've always had melodic uh, deficiencies, shall we say. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, you've got a different role. Mm hmm. And I stick to my lane, <laughs> but when I'm, until I'm called on to take a bass solo, and then I'm like, oh, I just crashed off the, just drive off the road, just go <laughs> into the ditch. Yeah, so yeah. I'm, I'm gonna keep these in mind when I'm trying to do my solo work of, you know. Yeah, I'm. I'm actually on my bass. I'm learning a dream theater song right now. Uh, <laughs> the dream theater song is "Endless Sacrifice." If you want to go listen to that. Oh yeah. But the number of phrase extensions in every single aspect of this is just blowing my mind and it's just crazy. Oh, wow. The chorus in particular, there's there's a lot of variation and you know, within you know, the uh, two measures of repetition and then something different. You know, <laughs> go, go go listen to that. It, it it's it's fun. Um something I wish I had said earlier is there's sort of two aspects to what we're talking about here. One is developing a melody across the the musical composition, mm -hmm. right? Where, where, where you see it to begin with versus what you, how you see it later. Or that's, that's one aspect. Uh -huh. The other aspect is how did you come up with that melody in the first place? And that's a lot, uh, maybe a little bit harder to grasp because what we're talking about now is the compositional process, mm -hmm. right? So when you're done, it's just going to be a melody, mm -hmm. hopefully a good one. <laughs> right? But how did you make it good? Well, you know, you started with a melody that was kind of maybe not as good as it could be and apply these techniques to create a better melody, mm -hmm. right? And so that's that's the other thing we're talking about. So, you know, in the one sense, yes, we are talking about how a melody looks the first time you see it versus the fourth time or, or whatever. And in another sense, we are also talking about how does this melody get created in the first place? The, the theoretical, analytical perspective versus the compositional process mm -hmm. right it's sort of the two things that that, that these techniques the, the two things we're talking about here yeah so and i wish i had said that more clearly at the beginning too but there you go that's mm -hmm. why you should listen to the end <laughs> yeah yeah and listen twice <laughs> and <know>. listen twice <laughs> Well, it was fun to get back into theory for a little bit, wasn't it? Was. It was. It was fun to get back into theory a little bit. And there'll be more to come, of course. Absolutely. So we will see you guys on the next one. We hope you leave this episode a newly inspired composer. Don't forget, our Listener Compositions episode is coming up. So, share some of your ideas with us. If you wish to help us financially check out the donate page on our website, musicstudent101.com. You can find merchandise on redbubble.com slash musicstudent101. For questions or comments, email us at info at musicstudent101.com.